Okay. So we were reviewing some of the things uh, from the theory of the ODE that uh, some results related to the continuous problem, and then we'll go ahead understanding that how do we define the numerical solution? That is the numerical approximation of uh, the continuous solution of this problem. So uh, we just we already discussed the existence and uniqueness results for the solution of this differential equation. Which is due to the Picards. And what does this theorem say? That if f, okay, f is anyway assumed to be continuous, okay? So I'm assuming that f is to be continuous. So in addition of the continuity, if we also have the Lipschitz continuity of the f with respect to the second variable, then we can ensure the unique solution in the neighborhood of the initial point, right? That's what the Picard's existence and uniqueness theorem says. So I'm just uh, roughly going to explain it. Let's suppose you have a domain D in R2, right? And we are having a rectangle. So suppose we have this as an initial point, X naught, Y naught, and we are considering a rectangle around this point. So that rectangle is basically going to depend on two parameters, A and B. So I'm having this is as X naught minus A and X naught plus A. And this is Y naught, this line is Y naught minus B. And this is Y naught plus B, where A, B are some real numbers. And I'm considering this rectangle. So this is going to be the rectangle R. And I'm choosing A and B such that R is contained in this domain D. Okay. And then the additional condition what we require is that F is Lipschitz continuous. So where it has to be Lipschitz continuous? On R. On R with respect to the second variable. That is with respect to the y, if f we are denoting it as a x, y. So let me write here, f x, y is Lipschitz continuous with respect to variable y on R. And I hope you all are familiar with the Lipschitz continuity. Uh, if not, I think I already uh, mentioned it that uh, what condition you have to set one has, f is to satisfy for it to be ellipsis continuous with respect to the variable y. Okay, then we have that this initial value problem, which is given by 1 plus 2. This has a unique solution in a neighborhood of the initial point, which is x naught here. So solution in a neighborhood of x naught. So in some neighborhood of this x naught, which will basically contained in this uh, interval mod x naught minus a. So this is the interval we will have it. Okay, so let me write. Uh, so we'll get this uh, say x naught plus delta and x naught minus delta. This is the interval where the solution exists. Where delta is what? Delta is depending on these parameters A, B, and the maximum of the function f over the over this rectangle R. Okay. 
So in short, if you have the Lipschitz continuity of the F together with the continuity, then we have a unique solution of the initial value problem in the neighborhood of the initial point. Okay, and one of you mentioned that uh, we also have the uh, sufficient condition to realize the Lipschitz continuity, right? Which is the the existence and the boundedness of the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Right. So let me just mention that all as well. So f again is a continuous function. And it is such that its partial derivative with respect to y, that is del f by del y, this exists and is bounded. then f is Lipschitz continuous. Okay, and this you can realize by in direct application of this uh, mean value theorem. You apply the mean value theorem with respect to the variable y and you will be able to realize that what you get is the, the Lipschitz condition. OK, and using this criteria, you can basically rewrite this existence and uniqueness theorem. So here you can replace the Lipschitz continuity by the continuity of the partial derivative. So let me state that. Let me state this as a corollary. So let D be a domain in R2 and I be some interval. So I'm just taking the same statement what I stated for existence and uniqueness theorem, that is a Picard's existence and uniqueness theorem. Only thing is that I'm going to replace the Lipschitz continuity requirement by the continuity of the partial derivative. Okay. And let f from d to r be continuous. Further, let the initial point x naught y naught, which is in d, it is such that the rectangle r. Which is defined by so on x axis the length of this rectangle is 2a, and on y axis the length of this rectangle is sorry, the length of the, the side is going to be so you can observe here the same thing, same figure what we have here, okay, same rectangle R. So this is contained in D. So for that, what we are assuming is that uh, if the partial derivative of F with respect to Y that is continuous, This is also continuous on the rectangle R, then there exists a unique solution by x of the initial value problem, which is given by 1 plus 2 in a neighborhood of x naught. So 
So the neighborhood also is going to be same. It is going to be a delta neighborhood where delta is going to be minimum of A and B by M. All right. So only thing is that uh, the Lipschitz condition is going is being replaced by the continuity of the partial derivative. And you can realize that this rectangle R is bounded. Okay. So you have if you have the continuity of uh, the partial derivative on this uh, bounded rectangle, then you will have that it is also going to be bounded. Okay. And that will give you the Lipschitz condition and uh, this basically goes back to the Picard's existence and uniqueness theorem. All right. So there's one more result which we uh, will be using uh, in obtaining the numerical methods. So that I'm going to state it as a lemma. So this is uh, what we are interested here is the solution of the differential equation together with this initial condition. That is a solution of the initial value problem. But there's a relation between a solution of this uh, initial value problem and the solution of an integral equation. Okay, so let me write this and then I'll explain it. So a continuous solution. Y, which is defined on an interval, let's call that I, containing the point X naught. So this is going to be a solution of the initial value problem, which is given by one plus two, if and only if y satisfies the following integral equation. So which is given by y x equals y naught plus integral x naught to x integral of f over the interval x naught to s ds. And this is true for all x is in high. Okay, so can you just try to see that how will you suppose you have to prove this result? How will you do it? So you have a y, you have one initial value problem here, and there's a this is an integral equation here. Okay, so the what we are claiming is that if y is a solution of the initial value problem, then it is also going to be a solution of this integral equation. And converse part, if y is y is continuous and it is going to be a solution of this integral equation, then it is also going to be the solution of the initial value problem. So how will you prove this? Okay, let's, uh, I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to just quickly explain it and you have to write down all the steps. So suppose, y is the solution of initial value problem, okay? Then how will you show that it will also satisfy this integral equation? What do you have to do? It's easy, right? You can simply integrate this. So integrate this uh, equation one from x naught to x. So if you integrate here, so what you will get, if you integrate y prime, you are going to get, uh, you're integrating from x naught to x, right? So you will get y at x minus y at x naught. And then you use the initial condition that y at x naught is nothing but y naught, right? So this is what you get it. Isn't it? So this you can observe by simply integrating one and then using two. So integrating, uh, you have to do the integration from x naught to x. Okay. So one side is uh, okay. And now how about the other part? That if we assume that y is a solution of this integral equation, and of course y is continuous, then 
this y will satisfy the differential equation together with the initial condition. So how will you prove this? And by Leibniz rule. Yeah, so you are going to differentiate, right? Yes. But for before differentiating, you have to know that y is differentiable. What is given to us is the continuity of the y, and of so course, it is, continuous. That, uh, it is continuous. So how will you, so only crux here is that how do you realize that y is differentiable? So it is again you can observe and it. Right from fundamental theorem. Fundamental theorem of calculus. Yes, because f is continuous, so the integral is going to be differentiable, and y naught is just a constant. So y is differentiable. So you can simply differentiate it. So once you will differentiate, you will get it that y prime is nothing but the uh, you have to apply the Leibniz rule. So f is a function of uh, uh, only s here. So when you will differentiate with respect to x, it will be zero. So you have to differentiate the upper limit and substitute x is equal to x, right? So differentiating. So let me give it equation number. So this is three. Differentiating three. We get one. Right, and then take x is equal to x naught in three. This will imply we get two. Right, to observe the initial condition, you just have to substitute x is equal to x naught. So when you will substitute x is equal to x naught, the integral will be zero because you have a limit x naught to x naught, and what you will be left with is that y at x naught is equal to y naught. Okay, so this basically establishes the characterization the that these two statement uh, whether you seek y the solution of this integral equation a continuous solution that is the same as seeking the solution of the initial value problem okay so this uh, equation 3 is also very important in the sense that it is used in deriving many of the numerical methods okay so now uh, we have uh, like you have seen a uh, many solutions method uh, to solve the differential equations right like you can make it, you can find the integrating factor or you can use the separation of the variables method. There are many methods uh, one can use to the solution of these initial value problem. Then what is the need of uh, these numerical methods which we are going to see further? So, so for most of the equation, you can find the solution, but there are a large class of the problems for which you cannot find the explicit solution. Okay, you can establish that there is going to be a unique solution. That is, you can use these uh, existence and uniqueness theorem, and you can establish that uh, we will have a unique solution, but finding it in a closed form is not always possible. Okay, so let me give an example. So for example, if we take y prime, this equals exponential of minus x squared, y at zero equals zero. And if you want to find the analytical solution of this uh, initial value problem, it is not possible because you can try to see you will have integration of the exponential of the mi minus x square, right? So which you do not know how to do it, right? So for example, now you can go back to use your, suppose you have to do integrate the exponential of minus x square. Of course, you have learned the numerical methods to find the approximation of the integrals, right? So again, the things comes back to the approximation. So for the problems which, for which we cannot find the exact solution, we would like to find the approximate solution, right? And which, uh, uh, though it is going to be approximate solution, but we will establish that uh, how the error is going to behave, that is how far the approximate solution and the exact solution is going to be, okay? So what we are going to do in the numerical methods, So suppose we are interested in finding the approximate solution of the initial value problem one and two in some interval AB. So let's call it uh, 
AV. Okay. So what do we do in the numerical methods? So we have an interval AB. So we will be uh, creating a dis uh, discrete set of points. Basically, it's the same thing. You will be creating a subdivision of this interval into a finitely many sub intervals. So you will have the points X0, X1, X2, and let's call this as Xn, right? So you will, so in the numerical method, we are going to find the approximate values of y at x i. Okay, let's call that y i. So using the numerical method, you will be basically finding the y i's and these y i's are going to be the approximate value of exact solution y at the these nodes x i. Okay, so this is what, uh, this is how we will be deriving the numerical methods. That that will yield the approximate values of the y at the discrete nodes. So these sub intervals which we are going to consider, so I'm going to take them, these nodes as an equally spaced node, that is I'm going to take xj's as x0 plus jh. So the length of each of these sub intervals is h. So H is going to be basically here, B minus A divided by N. So the first method, uh, which is the simplest method, to find the approximate solution of the, the exact solution at the nodes is the Euler's method. So let's see what do we do in this method. So we have this differential equation together with this initial condition. All right, so if I use the Taylor's expansion, so let me tell it uh, before itself that most of the methods which we are going to derive, they will be highly using either the Taylor's expansion or this integral equation, okay? Because in the integral equation, you have already developed the integration rules, right? How do we approximate these integrals? We have already developed uh, uh, various methods for that, right? So it is going to be either based on the numerical differentiation approach, which we have seen uh, in the numerical differentiation part, that is we use the Taylor's expansion, or we can directly use the integration rule here. So, so I'm going to use the Taylor's expansion to ex explain this method, but you can also do the use the integral equation and obtain it. That also I will remark it. So first, let's use the Taylor's expansion. Taylor's theorem. So note that I have to find the approximation of the y. Okay. So. xk plus 1 is any node. So I can write this as y at xk plus h. And now I'm going to apply the Taylor's expansion. So this is going to be y at xk plus h times y prime at xk plus the remainder term. Okay, so now if you observe y prime at xk is what? If I use the given differential equation, y prime, so this is y prime at x, this is equals right. So if I use That y prime at xk, this is the f at xk comma y at xk. So what do we get using this? We will get that y at xk plus 1, this is going to be y at xk plus h times f.
at x k and y at x k plus this term. Okay. So so far I have just taken the exact solution. So y is an exact solution here, and I have just realized that how we can so y at x k plus one. So I'm just checking it out that what what happens to a y at any of the nodes. Okay. So k here is varying from zero up to n. Sorry. So this is going to be one n minus one because we have n and from one. So so far, there's nothing called approximation. It is all about the exact solution. This is how the exact solution. Uh, this will yield the this result. What we have got. This is uh, we have used the Taylor's expense and considering the exact solution. Okay. So now this is going to give us that uh, give us the idea that what is the numerical method we can define here. Okay. So the y the Euler's method. is defined as as i explained i will be finding the approximate value of y at any of the x case right so let's call i'm defining it as a approximate value of y at x k plus 1 and i'm calling it as y by k plus 1 okay so this is given by y k plus h times f evaluate so net x k comma y k, but k is ranging between zero to n minus one. Okay, so this is the Euler's method, and you can realize that uh, I have just used this expression to define it. Okay, so I want to find the approximation of the y at x k plus one. So I have defined it as it is given by the y at x y k which is nothing but the approximation of the y at x k plus h times f of f evaluation at x k comma y k okay so in a layman language if i say that uh, so you can realize that y not is going to be the same as y at x not that is y, when you will take k is equal to 0 so you will get y not here right so this is actually the exact the initial condition y at x not okay so y not is going to be y at x not here and then you can compute y1 so y1 is going to be you can use this y not to compute the next iterate which is going to be h times f evaluation at x not y not because x not is also known to you and y not is also known to you once you have found y1 you can find the y2 by using the y1 right so likewise at the end you will be reaching it at yn which is going to be y at n minus 1 plus h times f evaluated at x minus n y n minus 1 okay so this is how you will find the approximate value of the y at x case so you can basically realize that here i have that the new value is going to be the old value which we have it plus h times the so if you realize this f at x k y k this is nothing but the if you try to see the given differential equation so f basically represents the slope at the point x comma y right so this f is basically representing the slope at the Point x k comma y k, right? So this is, so this is in the layman language. We can write it in this way. Okay. So I can try to explain it geometrically. That how does what is happening? So suppose we have the solution curve. So let's denote draw it. suppose this is how the solution looks like okay and let's take the point x not y not so this is x not and this is y not here 
So this is the point x naught comma y naught. Okay, so you try to observe from here. So what do we have? We have that the slope at x uh, at the point x k y k, which is nothing but the f of x k y k. This is given by y k plus one minus y k divided by h, right? And h you can see it as x k plus one minus x k, right? So if I see at uh, at this node, of course we have that uh, the slope is zero, right? So y one is going to be simply y naught. So let's say this is x one. X two and likewise. So so what is going to be the y one? So y one is going to be this point. X one y one will be here, right? Because you can observe that the this is h and this is so of course y not is going to be y one simply in this case because we have f of x not comma y not is zero. Okay, so at this node you can observe that the exact value is this. So this is y at x one, and this is the value which we have found by the approximation. So this is y one, right? So this is the basically error in y one. Which we will see the exact expression, but geometrically you can observe this way. Okay, so likewise you can continue. You can use this x one y one to find the x two y two, and likewise. Okay, so you can see that you will be committing some error in each of the steps. So let's try to understand that error. So we have the method as y at y k plus one is y k plus h times f of x k y k. Okay, and if I try to see what exact solution satisfy in this regard, that is, we have already written here this one. So we can use the Taylor's theorem to get. That y at x k plus one is y at x k plus h times f with this argument plus h square by two y double prime at some j k. So the first notion of the error which we are going to understand is a truncation error. So if I denote it by T K, so let's, because we are going to find it at the node X K plus one, so I'm denoting it by T K plus one. So what it is actually going to be? So you have to realize that suppose this is the method, okay? So if you try to observe the same in terms of the exact solution, that is, if I try to write the so from here, what I have, I have that y k plus one minus y k minus h times f of x k comma y k. This is equal to zero, right? This is what we have for the discrete solution. Now, for the exact solution, you are not going to have the same thing, right? You are not going to have that if you compute y at x k plus one minus y at x k minus h times f of x k y k. Basically, this term, right? This is not going to be zero. So, whatever is that term, that is your truncation error, right? So, for any method, how will you find the truncation error? You have to see what is the method, and accordingly, you have to see what happens if you substitute the exact solution in place of the discrete solution. That is, if I come in this case. My truncation error will be given by y at x k plus one minus y at x k 
minus h times f of x k y eight x k. Okay, that is I have just taken this numerical method and I have just uh, try to see what is happening if we take instead of a discrete solution as an exact solution. Okay, so this is we can see from this uh, relation that this is nothing but the h square by two by double prime at j. Okay, so this is called the this t k plus one is called basically the truncation error. So this you can also see this is the error in the approximation of y at x k plus one by this expression y at x k plus h times f of Okay, so when you try to approximate y at x k plus one by this expression, you are not going to get an equality. You will have an approximation, and whatever is the error you are committing here, that is your truncation error. So we can see from the Taylor's expansion, it is nothing but this term. Okay, so first of all, is the notion of this truncation error got clear? That how do we find the truncation error? So this is the idea is going to be the same for for uh, other methods also which we will be seeing further. So you have to see the numerical method. That what is the numerical method? And if we try to see the same expression in terms of the exact solution, whatever the error, whatever is the error you are going to commit, that is your truncation error. Okay. And note that this is at one node. We are at x k plus one. So at each node you will be committing this error. All right. So, but this is not that. This is not the the total error. So, this is I've just observed that what is happening in terms of my exact solution when I use this uh, numerical method. But the total error will be given by. So, it is going to be y at x k plus one minus y k plus one. This is going to be the total error. So, I'm simply going to subtract. Let me give it a question number. So this is going to be So let me call this is as four and this is as five and this is as six. So for total error, upon subtracting, so I'm subtracting four and five. On equation five, so we'll get this, and this is going to be. We know that what is y at x k plus one. It is this term. So it is y at x k plus h times f x k y at x k plus h square by two y double prime at some j k and y k plus one is y k plus h f of x k y k. Okay, so I can. This combine these terms. I am going to write down these two terms together. Y at x k minus y k plus h times f of x k. Y at x k minus f of x k y k plus h square by two y double prime h y k. Okay, so this is what we have. That it y at x k plus one minus y k plus one is given by this. So here, this is a truncation error. T k plus one, and this rest of the term, this is called the propagated error. Okay. So because of at each step, because of this truncation, 
you are having some error at each step and that error is getting propagated to the next step and to the next step right so let's write down exactly what this propagated error is and then try to understand it so we have the propagated error as y at xk minus yk plus h times f of xk y at xk minus f at xk comma yk. Okay, so let's further try to simplify this term. So if you use the mean value theorem, So I can apply the mean value theorem for this term. Okay. Treating it as a function of the second variable. Right, so I can write this as f at xk y at xk minus f at xk yk. This is del f by del y at xk comma some eta k where eta k is going to lie between y at xk and yk. So this will be evaluated that. So this will be, so let me write, so either you can write it here in the division or let me just multiply this. This will be multiplied by y at xk minus yk. So do not confuse with the y here, which I have in the argument. And so if you're, it is confusing to you, I can use here. You can treat y as a function of x and z. Okay, so let me write z here. And then I'm having these two points, y at xk and yk. And that's, so I'm applying the mean value theorem. Is it okay? So at any step, if you have any doubts, please clarify it immediately, okay? So therefore, uh, let's go back to this total error term. So let me give it a question number. So this is six, and this is going to be Seven. So let's denote uh, this error by ek plus one. Okay, so this is going to be, this term is going to be ek. So I'm setting ek as y at xk minus yk. Therefore, from seven, so we will have that ek plus one, this equals ek plus h times. So note that this we have already obtained. So this is going to be this term, del f by del z. With this argument times y k minus y at x k minus y k this is e k again okay times e k plus h square by 2 y double prime at j k so here j k is lying between x k and x k plus 1 and eta k lies between y at xk and yk. Okay, 
So if I combine these two terms, so basically I have got that EK plus one is one plus H times the left by del Z XK at eta K times EK plus H square by two Y double prime at JK. So let's give it a question number. This is going to be eight. Okay. So we are further going to simplify this expression. So if we assume, so if we try to go back to the the continuous label, so we have the con. Uh, Let this uh, just try to look back the existence and uniqueness theorem. So there we have the that this uh, partial derivative of f with respect to the second variable, this is bounded, right? So if we assume the similar thing here, that is if we assume that del f by del z at xk, with y at x k, this is less than L for some L, okay? And if we assume that the second derivative of y, this is also bounded by, let's call it capital Y, then what we can get is that so if we try to use this equation number eight, so let me write here that L and Y are fixed positive constants. then we can obtain that mod of ek plus one, this is less than equal to one plus h times l times mod of ek plus h square by two into y. Okay, let's call it uh, this relation as nine. So now we can use this relation recursively. That is, we have the bound on the ek plus one in terms of the ek. Then I can bound ek in terms of the ek minus one. So this is how we can use the recursive relation. So finally, what we will obtain? Applying this estimate. Recursively. So we will get that ek plus one, this is less than equal to one plus hl, and ek is going to be less than equal to one plus hl times mod of ek minus one plus h square by two into y, and this term will remain as it is. So if we simplify, this is one plus hl square mod ek minus one plus one plus one plus hl times h square by two into y. So further, if we continue repeating this process up to the point when I reach E0, right? Because we know that uh, E0 is nothing but y at x naught minus y naught, which is nothing but zero. So I'll go up to the point uh, E0. So I'm going to get the power of one plus HL as K plus one times no, one times E naught. And here I will have the summation of the terms up to the power of one plus HL as what is going to be the power of the last term. So this is going to be K. 
quantity times h square by 2 into y. So is it okay so far? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this is how uh, the e k plus 1, uh, the bound on the e k plus 1, we get it. So I can very well write it for the e k. So e k is going to be 1 plus h l raised to power k mod e naught plus 1 plus. So this summation will be. So basically, I'm replacing k by k minus 1 here. k minus 1 times h square by 2 into y. So these expressions we have to further simplify. So you have to observe two properties. So the first property which you have to observe is that. So for this term, I can simply use the what I can use here for to simplify this summation. Yes, geometric series. The geometric series, right? So you can have the summation of the geometric series here. So I can write this as so you have alpha is not equal to one. Then we have that one plus alpha plus alpha square up to alpha is to power j. This is nothing but alpha is to power j plus one minus one divided by alpha minus one. Right? So this is a uh, this property we are going to use to simplify this term and for this term. You have to realize that if we have that 1 plus X is greater than or equal to 0, then. 1 plus X raised to power N, this is going to be less than or equal to. Exponential of NX. Now, how do you realize this? So observing this is the same. As observing this statement that. Can we observe that 1 plus X is less than equal to exponential of the X? Then we will take the power N both side and we'll get this relation. So can you observe that whether we will have this or not? Yes, ma'am. By power Any? series extension. Yeah, so you can uh, you can see the power series, or you can simply observe this by the Taylor's theorem as well, right? The Taylor Taylor's uh, the power series is nothing but the you get it using the Taylor's expansion, right? So you can see if you try to write down the Taylor series expansion of this, you will get it as in the neighborhood of zero. Okay, so you will get it as one plus x plus x square by 2 exponential of j. Right? So this is going to be positive. This is positive. So 1 plus x is strictly less than exponential of x. And then you take the uh, power n both sides. So you will observe this relation. OK, so I'm going to use these two to simplify this expression here. So let's call it uh, 9. Therefore, 9 reduces to. So I will have mod of e k plus 1. This is less than equal to. So 1 plus h l raised to power k plus 1 is going to be less than equal to exponential of k plus 1 into x. Exponential of k plus 1 into x times x is 1 plus h l. Okay. So x uh, 1 plus x we are applying. So it is going to be HL. So exponential of K plus 1 times H into L times mod of E naught plus for this term I will get it as 1 plus HL raised to power K minus 1. Sorry, I'm applying for the EK plus 1. 
So I will get it k plus 1 minus 1 divided by hl into h square by 2 into y. So is everything correct? Okay, or I could have directly written it for the EK so that we can. This is going to be EK HL mod E naught plus 1 plus HL raised to power K minus 1 divided by HL H square by 2 into Y. So for this term, again, we can use the same thing. So this is going to be exponential of HL into K mod of E naught plus this is also going to be exponential of HLK minus 1 divided by and note that 1 power of H cancels out from here. So we will have it uh, H by divided by 2L. Okay. And H into K, if you observe, what is this? This is nothing but XK minus X naught. So this is exponential of XK minus X naught into L mod of E naught is Y at X naught minus Y naught which in our case, if we see the way we are defining the method, it's going to be same. That is y at x naught is the same as y naught. So it will be zero, but let me write it. So here I will get it as exponential of xk minus x naught into L minus one into h y divided by two L. Okay, so this is what we get. So let me state this, uh, the error relation by a theorem whatever we have got here. So if we take, so the solution is anyway, we are going to have it in the C2. Let Y be a solution of IVP. Oh, I think we already gave the equation number. It was, we started with it, right? So it is going to be one plus two. Good. So what are the assumptions we had in obtaining this result? That del f by del y, this is bounded and second derivative of y is bounded by y for all x, y. And for some constants, l and y. Okay, then what we have obtained the, that the mathematical error in Euler's method at a point xk, which is x naught plus kh, this satisfies. that mod of EK is less than equal to whatever we have got here. So this is HY divided by 2L exponential of XK minus X naught minus one plus exponential of XK minus X naught into L times mod of X naught minus Y naught. Okay. So is it okay so far? Yes, ma'am. All right. 
So note that it's still if you uh, in this term, of course, you see the power of the power. Uh, it is behaving like y is a constant, l is a constant, and so if you try to see that you have this complete term as a multiplication of h, right? And in this term, anyway, for our case, it is going to be zero. But let me state the general result. Suppose you have y at x naught minus y naught. What we require that it should be less than or equal to some constant times h, right? Then also we will get that the for this term also we will have the one h factor coming out, and for this term also we will have one h factor coming out, right? But let's not go into that. Let me just take the easier one. So for our case, this term is simply zero. All right, but still, if you try to observe the first term, you have the exponential term coming here, right? So you have h multiplied by some constant, which is depending on the exponential of the x k minus x naught. So this is basically going to give you an upper bound of the error. Like this is going to be a um, we can further basically make this bound more sharp in the sense that. Uh, this exponential term is going to be very large. Okay, so this is going to be a, a kind of over determination of the error. So we can further simplify this term under certain assumptions that if you have certain properties on the partial derivative of the y f with respect to y, then this error can further be simplified. So let's try to observe that. Okay, before that, let's take one example and. Uh, Try to see what is happening so that you get a good, uh, better feel about this error here. Let's take an example. So suppose we have to solve this problem. Y prime is equal to 2x with y at 0 equals 0. OK, so we can write down the general uh, it, the iteration term. So we can write down the n plus 1 at the uh, Iteration of Euler's method is so this will be given by y at so let me use the same index k y at k plus one equals y k plus so we have to have f of x k y k which is two x k. And multiplied by h, right? So this is y k plus two h x k. So you can do. Uh, suppose you have to find uh, the. We are given the initial point at zero, and suppose you have to find the value at some point. Uh, let's call it one. Okay. So you will be taking an h. As b minus a, which is going to be one by n. So depending on how many points you want to have, but what we are interested at this point, which are whatever is the number of points you choose it, I want to understand the error for this method. Okay, so e zero is going to be zero because we take y naught as the y at same as the y at x naught. So therefore, if we try to use this error formula, which we have it. Uh, in here. Let me just try to use directly. This formula. OK, so we have sorry this uh, we have simplified version. This is eight. Therefore, by eight. What do we have? We have that e k plus one. This is e k times one plus h times del f by del y, right? And you'd see that this is the del f by del, uh, this is f here. So f x y is two x. So you see that del f by del y is going to be zero. Okay. So you will have there h times zero plus h square by 2 and you have to find a second derivative of the y and take the maximum over that. So you can realize here that y double prime is simply 2, which is a constant. So we will get this as 2 here. 
Okay, so upon simplification, what do we have? That this is a k plus h square. All right. So if we try to observe that e zero is zero, so e one is going to be e zero plus h square, which is nothing but uh, h square, right? E two is going to be e one plus h square, which is going to be two h square. So basically, recursively, if you use here, you will get e k as k times h square. All right. In the last step, we are going to take it as x n. So from here, we can get that e n is nothing but n times h square. And n into h is going to be the length of the interval, which is b minus a, which is nothing but one in this case times h. So basically, what do we have? That e n is proportional to the h. Okay. So the convergence here is linear. All right. So this was a kind of an easy case because you had del f by del y as zero, so you could simplify the things here. But otherwise, you have this expression, and there's a one more condition which, uh, if we take on the del f by del y, we can further simplify this expression. So let me give a equation number and then I explain that. So this is ten. So remark that we can improve. Improve in the sense that we can get a better estimate. We can improve the result, which we have it in 10 under certain conditions. So now let's see what those conditions are going to be. So we are going to assume that if we have that del f by del j, that is the partial derivative of f with respect to the second argument, if that is less than or equal to zero, okay. So this we are going to assume, and it is bounded. for all z and for all x in the interval so let's take it in between x naught and b then we can get a better we can further simplify this term I, I should rather say right we can basically get rid of these exponential terms here and can get a simpler expression so let's see how do we do that so note that uh, this condition from here, I can simply, if you try to see what do I have here in terms of the del f by del y, the equation number eight, we have this expression, right? So if I want to bound the absolute value of the e k plus one, I will get the absolute value of the one plus h times del f by del z x k eta k, right? So in a way, if I get to some bound of this term, then I'll be sorted. You will see that if I can estimate this term, I'll be have uh, my life will become easier. Basically, I'll be able to get rid of these exponential terms here. Okay. So this means if I want to get some bound here, this means that I have to get the upper bound of this term, del f by del z, x k eta k. Say if I want to get it as m, then I have to get it upper bound and all as well as lower bound. Right, then I'll be through. So this is what I'm going to have here that if I have this term, this is Johnson, then if I simplify this term one plus H times del F by del Z, this is going to be less than equal to one. Right. 
So I've simply multiplied by H and then added one both side. So the another thing if uh, I need that if I can have this is greater, this is greater than minus one, then we are done. We will be able to have that one plus H times del F by del Z absolute value of that that is less than equal to one. OK, so let's do a little uh, rough work. So if I want to choose my. OK, so let's try to use this property that we have that del F by del Z is bounded. OK, so using this boundedness, you will be able to have that del F by del Z. This is less than the absolute value of that is less than equal to some M, right? This means that this is less than equal to M and greater than equal to minus M. So if I multiply by H and add one, so I will get this as one plus HM and this is going to greater be greater than equal to. One minus HM. Right, so since I'm interested in the lower bound, let's focus on this term. So what I have is that one plus H times del F by del Z that is. Greater than equal to one minus HM. OK, so if I can choose my H. Such that this one minus HM, this is greater than minus one. Then note that I will have that one plus H times del F by del Z. This is also greater than minus one. Right, and we already have that this is less than equal to one. OK, so this basically gives you the idea that how you have to choose your H, right? So. I'm going to choose such H. Basically what I want that I want. So I'm assuming that I can find an H. H is chosen. Such that that we have one plus H times del F by del Z. This is greater than equal to minus one. OK, and this would hold for all. X between X naught and B. OK, and also for all Z. Then what do we have? In view of these two equations, so if I call this, so uh, let's call it a star, and this is double star. So from these two relations, we get that one plus h times del f by del z. This is less than equal to one. OK, so I can use this relation in equation number eight now. So here, so note that I have got that uh, this is less than equal to one, so I can get the bound on the absolute value of the AK plus one. So then. From eight. We have that absolute value of EK plus one is going to be less than equal to. So we will have one plus H times del F by del Z, which is less than equal to one. So I will be left with absolute value of EK plus. H square by two. Into this term, right? So if I I have already to find the bound on that. So this is going to be. So let me write it here. So I can write this as some constant times h square, where this constant is nothing but one by two of maximum of second derivative of y over the interval a b. Okay. So basically, we have got a Simple, simpler form of the relation. So again, we can apply the uh, 
this recursive relation that we can bound e k by the e k minus one and then e k minus one by e k minus two in that way. So what I will get? So let me give it equation number and then so this is ten. This is going to be eleven. So I'm going to apply this uh, equation induct inductively. So using equation ten recursively to obtain that mod of e k is going to be less than equal to. So I will go up to e zero. Okay. So this is going to be less than equal to e k minus one plus you will get two c h square, right? And this I will go up to mod of e naught. So you will get this as k c h square. So in this case, it is going to be k plus one times c h square. Okay, and mod of e naught is zero. So we will get this as mod of e naught plus k times c h square. Okay, which is the same as k times c into h square, since e naught is zero. Okay. And k times h, we already know that this is going to be x k minus x naught. So therefore, what we have obtained is that this is less than equal to some constant times x k minus x naught into h, where this k times h is x k minus x naught. Okay. So if you compare. This relation 12 with the relation 10 here. So here uh, you can observe that we were having a multi multiple of the h in terms of the x k minus x naught, but that was growing exponentially. Okay, but here you can realize that. Uh, so we still have the e k as the multiple of the h, but the constant which we have in terms of the x k minus x naught, it is growing linearly. OK, so if we have this additional assumption on the uh, the del f uh, y del y, then we can further simplify this term in this way. So let me just uh, give a remark. So from 12. We have that. The error is bounded by a quantity which is pro proportional to H. Quantity which is proportional to H and the coefficient of H this increases linearly with respect to the point XK. In contrast to exponential growth in equation ten. Okay. So now uh, one thing uh, you have, if you pay attention, what was the truncation error? So if you observe the truncation error was h square by two into by double prime at some point, right? So that basically truncation error was proportional to h square. But if you observe this total error is just proportional to h. Okay, so the truncation error is basically a local error. So you can understand that that. Uh, we have the subdivision 
right? And from when you go from x naught to x one, at x naught you are having the exact value y naught. But from when you go from x naught to x one, you will have some truncation error here at this node, right? And when you go from here to here, you will have some truncation error. So this truncation error is basically getting at accumulated at each step, right? And how many steps you are going? You are going n steps, right? So if I call truncation error as local error. So the total error you can see it as n times the local error, right? Like in a layman language, if we try to observe. So this I'm relating it to the truncation error. Okay. So if your local error is of order h square, say if I have local error is some constant times h square, and then we get after. After n steps, we, this will be the total error. So n times h is going to be b minus a. If I call this as a and this as b, because n times h is x n minus x naught, which is b minus a. Right. So this gets proportional to h. So if in general, what I can say, if my local error is of order h raised to power k plus H raised to power say r plus one. Then when you will find the global error, it is going to be you will apply the same technique that it will be stored at each of the the node point. So you will have total number of n node points. So you will get it as at each step you are committing this error. So after n step you will get this as error. So basically it is going to be of order h raised to power so we lose one order of convergence when you go from local error to the global error. Okay. And you can see the global error here is converging just with order H. Right. So this is uh, this is like if you try if you reduce your mesh size by half, that is if you go from H to H by two, your error will be just getting halved. If you try to see in terms of the truncation error. So let me write it here. So if I observe my truncation error, right, that was of order h square. So if I go reduce my mass size, that is if I reduce the length of the interval from h to h by 2, the tk plus 1 will get reduced by tell me what will be the factor it will be reduced by you have h square sitting here right so it will be reduced by the factor right in terms of the global error it will be reduced by a factor 2 okay so sorry Yeah, so this is the main advantage disadvantage of this method that error gets reduced very slowly. I mean, there are other methods which you will see that uh, we will get a better convergence in in the sense that uh, we will have truncation error is of higher order. So here we have got it say order H square. So we can design a method uh, where the truncation error will be of order H cube or H raised to power four. So eventually the global error will have a better order of convergence. OK, so uh, for now we stop. And uh, we'll see those methods in the next class. But I, uh, I just expect uh, you guys to be clear with uh, these, uh, these facts that okay, what are the truncation error? What do we do in the numerical methods, right? Because many I have in my past uh, experiences when I've taught this course before, I see that uh, students even confuse with the y at x k and y k. They consider both are same, but both are not same. Okay, so just be clear uh, that what exactly like we are doing, like we are approximating the values of the y at x case. So at many places, uh, uh, people just make a mistake treating y k as a y at x k. Both are not the same. 
okay so just uh, just spend some time uh, just be comfortable with it so that uh, uh, when we go further it's going to be easy for you guys and i have just been informed that uh, you guys are not attending the tutorial session so what is the problem so is it that uh, you guys are able to solve the problems completely or is there any other reason for that why you guys are not attending the tutorial session somebody <laughs> <laughs> 